Great. So all the different networks that make up the internet, whether data center networks or backbone networks or enterprise networks, need to do routing. And when they're doing routing, they're often grappling with a bunch of different trade-offs. They want to be able to pick paths through the network based on a variety of different performance metrics, like minimizing congestion or minimizing delay. So they have traffic engineering goals. And those goals could be quite complicated. They could vary. Maybe some traffic needs uh, to minimize latency and others need to minimize throughput. They also may want to route based on certain constraints. For example, they may want certain traffic to go through a waypoint that might do some sort of firewalling or intrusion detection, or even a whole uh, service chain of middle boxes that might be providing important functions. And, the, and yet, in the face of both of those goals, they also want fast adaptation when the metrics that define the performance of the paths change, or worse yet, when failures happen. And so to be able to satisfy all three of these at the same time is very challenging, and very few networks manage to do all three. Uh, what's exciting, and, and Nate mentioned in his introduction, is the emergence of a new technology in, in, in the data plane that allows you to have much more flexible control over how packets are, are forwarded and, and processed. And so I'm going to spend a moment talking about that. And th these are what are called programmable or uh, data planes or protocol independent switch architecture. And roughly what they allow you to do is when a packet comes into the switch, there's a parser that you can define that will decide which parts of the packet, which bits in the header, are of interest for processing. This is going to let us put I extra information in packets that might not normally be understandable in a commodity commercial switch and be able to use that to help us achieve some of our goals. And then we also have the ability to go through a pipeline of processing elements that will allow us to compute things like metrics that might be useful for making forwarding decisions. And finally, there's also state. And that state is going to allow us to keep information from one packet to the next. Uh, that could be information about the performance that you've learned about a path. Or it could be information about how you forwarded a previous packet in the same ongoing conversation, particularly if you want those packets to be grouped together and processed in the same way. So flexible parsing that will allow us to define our own headers. Flexible processing that will allow us to compute statistics and, and forwarding decisions. And flexible state that will allow us to remember information about probes and past forwarding decisions. And we can program all these using a language called P4 that Nate and myself and others have been working on for a number of years. So actually, before I go on, are there any, any questions about, about PISA architectures? I imagine they'll come up in, in several of the talks today. OK. So, so this will allow us, uh, using these programmable switches, to define fine-grained link metrics, statistics about the utilization of the links or how backlogged the queues might be in a given switch. This will allow us to compute the path metrics and compute the best path. And finally, allow us, as I mentioned, to keep state across packets that will allow us to compute what are called flowlets that allow us to take a group of packets that are a part of the same conversation and pin them to use a particular next time. So in this example, I might, for example, have links of utilization 20% and 30%. Locally, each of those switches can know that information. They can exchange information directly in the data plane to compute the fact that this path has a max utilization of 30%, the max across those metrics. And then I might be able to take a group of packets, like the red packets here, and say this group of packets that are part of the same ongoing flow should all be forwarded on this path because it has lower utilization than, say, the lower path. And yet, when a new set of uh, packets from a different flowlet come, there'll be an opportunity to revisit that decision and take advantage of what might be the current best path at this time. And so this basic style of routing is not a new idea. It's been uh, conceived of for a long time. And even doing it in the data plane is not an entirely new idea. There's work called Conga and, and Hula over the last few years that do exactly this. So they essentially, uh, but they do this in a, with a number of limitations that we're going to overcome uh, in this work. So in particular, they focus on specific topologies, and in particular, data center network topologies that typically have a, a sort of leaf spine structure with a large number of shortest paths that can be computed in advance. So they can load balance over, over those multiple paths using, using these flexible metrics. Now, that's some, we would like to actually handle arbitrary topologies, including routing over paths that are not the shortest if those offer better performance. The second is they focus on particular metrics for defining the paths, in particular, finding the least utilized shortest path. And we'd like to support a much wider range of path selection criteria than that, because a lot of different kinds of networks may have different performance goals. And finally, uh, they don't support routing constraints. They just load balance over the paths, but they don't consider the fact that you might have some constraints on which paths you do not want to get used. For example, you might not want certain traffic to traverse a certain link or node, or you might want to force certain traffic to go through a certain set of waypoints on the way. So these are the, the limitations of Conga and Hula we'd like to overcome, while still keeping all of the decisions directly in the data plane, operating at line rate, so that we can adapt very quickly uh, to changes in the topology and in performance. So 
essentially then what we want in defining contra, and I should say all of these schemes have a, a theme now of, of being named after different kinds of dance. So conga, hula, and ours is called contra to kind of keep in that. Uh, keeping that same, same theme. So we want to be able to handle a wide range of metrics for defining which paths are good. We want to be able to have flexible path constraints based on regular expressions, and we want to support arbitrary topology. So that's really our main goal, is to take these works and extend them in that way, but we want to be distributed so that we can make decisions quickly and scalably without a central controller, and yet deal with the kind of issues that often arise when doing distributed load sensitive routing, in particular wanting to make sure we avoid protocol oscillation. And when metrics are stable, we want ideally to converge relatively quickly uh, to the best path. We want to be performant. So if events happen, we want to react quickly. If uh, there's, we want to have relatively low overhead in collecting information about the paths and, and low overhead in what we put on the packets. If forwarding loops arise, and sometimes they will, as the different switches in the network have different views of which way to forward a packet, we want to make sure we mitigate forwarding loops and still obey whatever constraints we've put on which paths are not allowed in the network. And when possible, avoid packets being delivered out of order for the same ongoing flow. And that's important because we'd ideally like to avoid uh, higher level protocols that tend to assume that packets arrive in order from having the opposite happen. And finally, we'd like to implement all this directly in the switches in the data plane, scalably and in a way that can react quickly to network events. So those are, those are the goals we started with. And so at a high level, what we're gonna do is allow a network administrator to specify a high level routing policy in a high level language. And then a compiler is gonna synthesize a distributed set of P4 programs that'll run directly in the data plane. So nobody that's running the network will be writing P4. P4, although it's better than writing machine code, is still a pretty low-level language. And so our goal is actually to automatically generate that, that code uh, for the network administrator. And then this gets out of the way. Once that step is done at compile time, the network runs completely on its own, distributing whatever information it needs to to make good, uh, good routing decisions. Okay, so I'm going to kind of walk you through now uh, how we define the high-level language. So at a high level, what we want are two things. We want to be able to specify first a function that's going to decide the ranking of network paths. So there are a lot of different paths through the network, and this distributed algorithm is going to need to pick the best ranked path at each node in the network based on some criteria. And those two criteria, first we want to be able to decide constraints on the paths using regular expressions. So this will be our way of specifying all traffic needs to go through a particular waypoint or a particular service chain, or certain traffic shouldn't go through a particular link at all. And then subject to those constraints, we want to be able to specify the metrics on the path that will dictate which path is deemed best. And so I'll give you just two simple examples. So here's one where we want to have all traffic go through a waypoint. So packets can start with at any place in the network. They must go through node W, and then they can take zero or more hops after that. All the paths that have that will be picked amongst using the utilization of the path. Otherwise, there's a cost of infinity to indicate that the, the other paths that don't go through W are unacceptable, you're not willing to take them. So we want the least congested path subject to the constraint that the traffic must go through the waypoint. Here's a slightly more complicated example where I want to route traffic based on utilization, but if you route traffic based on the minimum utilization and the network is heavily congested, taking a slightly longer than necessary path can make the network worse than before. So ideally what we'd like is to pick the minimum utilized path of all paths including non-shortest paths, unless the network is really heavily loaded, in which case we'd rather take the least utilized shortest path to avoid further exacerbating that congestion. And that's what this does here. So if utilization of a path is below 80%, we essentially have a, a metric that's a concatenation of one, zero, and the path utilization. So here you would pick the best, least utilized path. Otherwise, you penalize the path for, the path for being uh, highly congested and judge it based on its length, followed by its path utilization. So if all the paths in the network are heavily congested, all of them will be in this else clause, and you'll be judging, picking the shortest path, and then breaking ties based on path utilization. But if any path is less than 80% utilized, you'll prefer amongst those paths the least loaded one, independent of the length of the path. Okay, and those are just two sort of simple examples. Those will be written by the network administrator, and then at compile time, we'll take that and synthesize a distributed routing protocol that realizes that policy. So any, any questions at this point? Yeah. It, it seems like this is assuming that deterministic routing, or are there going to be bells and whistles that allow for randomized routing? It's going to be, it's going to be deterministic. It's going to be load sensitive, so there will be dynamics, but it's not going to make any randomized decisions. 
Yes. Um, is that, do you describe the metric in a compositional way? Do you sort of describe a metric for part of the, of the network and then maybe a different metric and choose them together? Or how does Are you asking about the protocol or the? One, is there one metric for the whole, one, one policy for the whole network? Uh, so we'll be, uh, this, the, this example doesn't show up, but you could imagine having regular expressions with complicated if then else clauses. So you might have one part of the network that say, using only path length and another part of the network that's using only utilization. And as you can imagine, this foreshadows things I'm going to talk about in a moment. You end up with policies that are not isotonic. And so we'll have to grapple with that. Yeah. yeah. No, it's going to be purely distributed. I'll get to that in a moment. This is just to, just to be clear, this is just the high-level policy written by the network administrator. We're going to synthesize a distributed protocol where each node has a minimal amount of information that collectively leads to this, this policy being observed. Yeah. Other, other questions? But yeah, that's exactly the, the, the key to the work is to, is to figure out how to do that. Okay. So essentially what we're going to do is, is what we're going to generate is a, we're going to generate our own routing protocol from this high level specification, but they're all going to be part of a family of similar routing protocols that do distance vector routing. So just as a refresher, distance vector routing, we're going to have each node know the metric of the downstream path. For example, in this case, this node might know the downstream path has a maximum utilization of 30%. And it will announce that to its upstream neighbor. Its upstream neighbor will combine that with its knowledge about its own link and, and compute that this now slightly longer path also has a max utilization of 30%. Now we're using distance vector routing because that's going to allow us to have flexible constraints on, on which paths get used as compared to link state routing where there has to be more global agreement on exactly what the metrics are that are being minimized. And it's also going to be implementable in the data plane because we're not keeping some sort of complex database of the entire network topology. We're just keeping local information about the metrics advertised by the neighbors. And that's going to allow us to work within the fairly limited computational model that these modern switches have, to, to answer uh, Edith's question. So this is an example. Path probes will come in one direction, indicating the properties of the path. And if that path gets picked, data packets will go in the reverse direction uh, towards that given next hop. So, what we have to do then to make this work is have a set of building blocks for solving a number of the problems. We have to have a good way to monitor the performance of the paths. We need to be able to enforce those constraints I mentioned earlier that don't that disallow certain paths from being used or allow nodes to locally prefer one kind of path over another. We need to be able to compare and select amongst multiple paths based on those metrics. We need to have a way to group packets together and pin them to a particular forwarding decision. And we have to have a way of preventing loops while still obeying the, the high-level policy. So those are going to be the, the technical challenges. And I'm going to kind of walk through how we address each of those. So the first problem that some of the questions here were hinting at is you might have fairly complicated policies where different nodes have different uh, and perhaps even inconsistent ways of ranking paths. So here's an admittedly pretty toy example. Let's suppose here the, the links are weight, weighted by what the utilization of the link is. And for whatever reason, node A would want to pick ABD. The network administrators decided that no matter what, we'd really rather ABD be used if it's available. But all other nodes in the network would prefer to pick the minimum utilized path. And so that's what this little program on the left is doing. If ABD, then zero, that means it's the lowest cost path, the most preferred. Otherwise, everything will be, uh, have a, a weight related to the utilization of the path. So what's going to go wrong here in a, in a simple distance vector protocol is that you would, uh, you, if you were just propagating the best path, if every node was picking a path based on its own uh, ranking and propagated only that metric to its upstream neighbor, we can't actually get this policy to be correctly implemented. And I'll just show you a simple example. Node B, once it learns from D and C, the two different paths that it has, would pre prefer the path BCD because it has a maximum utilization of 10% over the path BD, which has a higher maximum utilization of 20%. That's all well and good. B is happy. But if B only propagates that information to A, A will be obliged to pick ABCD, and that's not its most preferred path. Right? ABD is available, but is not being advertised. And so we've ended up picking something that actually doesn't satisfy the policy. Okay, so this, would, so we, this is not acceptable. We have to have a solution to this problem. And this is an example of a policy being not isotonic. So an isotonic policy means that every node's ranking is consistent with the other nodes in the network. So here, B and A do not have consistent rankings. B's best path is not a subpath of A's best path. And so we actually have no choice but to propagate further information in the protocol to make sure A has the ability to make the choice that B won't make for it. 
So just to, to pick an example, what we're going to do then is decompose this higher level policy into two different policies and have to propagate additional information in the network so that A has the ability to choose among the two paths. So in this case, for example, B might pick the path BCD with a particular metric, but it will also propagate the path BD. So two different uh, update messages will go to A, allowing A to pick amongst the two choices. And the second thing that means is not only will A have to get a little bit more information, so that's going to be a, a cost of scalability to us that we'll have to grapple with in a moment, but A will also have to tag its packets so that B knows when the packet arrives which of the two paths is the one A actually intends for its packets to traverse. So for this, we're taking advantage of the flexible parsing that I mentioned earlier. We're going to add information to packets that tag them with enough information, in this case one extra bit, to tell us which way uh, to, to go out of the paths that B has advertised. So we'll have to advertise extra paths and tag the packets so that the, the, the node knows which way to forward. And in particular, in this case, B will forward its own traffic on a different path than it will forward packets coming from A. Okay. Any, any questions? Yeah. Right. That says to me that you don't believe that something like this embodied in the policy, uh, you've, all, you've just decided that there's no way for A to delegate it to you. Right. In some sense, it's being decided by, by the network administrator writing the policy in this way. It's saying that for some reason, the traffic that originates at A has special concerns. Like, and it might be a particular class of traffic, for example, that really needs to go on the path ABD because maybe there's some particular functionality that is only available on that path, or maybe one of these links on the BCD path is untrusted for some reason. So think of it as, you're right, it's a lack of delegation, but I, I wouldn't anthropomorphize the nodes because they're just blindly executing the, the specification from the network administrator that is, for whatever reason, decided that A and B have different concerns. Yeah, does, that, does that make sense? And, and this example is very toy. I mean, I think example, example would make more sense if there was a particular middle box that was on the ABD path that wasn't available on the other path, and A was a particular class of traffic that really needed to go through that middle box. That would be a more natural example. This one's admittedly quite toy. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, forwarding is really based on, on all of these criteria, the regular expressions, the metrics, and obviously the destination right, also. Not yeah, exactly, not at all. Um, another question, so to what extent is the, is the framework topology agnostic? I think one of the design criteria said that it would work in any topology. Yep. The policy needs to be written in terms of some identifiers about the nodes. Right, right. So, and that's, so there's two things we're assuming. We're assuming there's the, 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 central, the compiler knows the designed topology. It doesn't know which links are up or down at any given time, but we're going to, at a moment you'll see, we'll rely on knowing at least the topology on the ground in the absence of failures. And the second thing is if there are any particular services or properties of the path that can be expressed in the regular expression, we're assuming the network administrator knows them. Like, for example, if the CD link were untrusted, uh, for some reason it's going through another country that is perhaps has different policies or might be doing surveillance, then that might be factoring into the decision that A's traffic doesn't go through the CD link. So we're assuming that kind of global knowledge, but not dynamic, dynamic global knowledge. Yeah. Other questions? So the rest of the challenge then falls to the, to the, to the protocol to implement. So essentially what we're going to do uh, to foreshadow is whenever there's an inconsistency like this, where no different nodes will have different rankings of the paths, we're going to have to advertise, in some sense, maybe in this case, two paths rather than one in the protocol. And so now part of our challenge is to figure out we don't want to advertise everything. That would be an extreme case where we all nodes advertise all paths that they learn and allow anybody to use any of them. Uh, that would work but wouldn't scale very well. So now the challenge is how do we figure out the minimal amount of information that we actually have to advertise to be able to achieve the goals of each of the nodes and also respect the routing constraints. And so I'm going to talk a moment about that. And in particular now, how are we going to do this efficiently? So, First of all, as I mentioned before, these constraints, these regular expressions, are going to uh, affect the how a sh determine how a shape of the path, as defined by the regular expression, affects its ranking. And so how are we going to realize those regular expressions? So we can implement them as a sort of deterministic finite automata that is implemented in a distributed fashion as the probes traveling from the destinations towards the sources uh, get, get shaped. 
So just to take a slightly more complicated example, again, still fairly contrived, we could imagine a policy if ABD then zero, that's the one we described on the previous slide. And then if, an, if there's another path, B, we would like, if, if you're going from B to the destination, we'd like to pick based on path utilization and otherwise disallow the paths. Those two regular expressions in red and in green can be implemented as little DFAs where every time a probe goes through the, the network, it actually goes one step further towards satisfying or not satisfying this DFA. Notice I've, the DFA here is, is implemented backwards because we're taking probes from the destination towards the source. And so we're gonna walk backwards through the DFA. And when a probe reaches a node, the probe will be tagged with state about the DFA. So the node knows how far along we are in satisfying that DFA. That will determine whether the path can be used at all. And it will also determine the transition of the DFA that that node itself will implement in propagating the probe to its own neighbors. So probes will now carry a uh, state about the satisfying of the DFAs as they go. Okay. That's sort of the, the first observation. Now, now, how do we figure out when we need to propagate more than one probe? So here now, to, to Nate's question, we need to know something about the, about the topology. So the topology is gonna to determine, uh, first of all, certain transitions in the DFA that can't happen. To pick a particular example, imagine the path DAB. DAB doesn't even exist on the graph because there's no link between DNA. But the, the automaton doesn't know that. And so by, with knowledge of the topology, we can actually reduce the amount of propagation of probes that happen because we don't have to allow all possible paths to exist, just the ones that could exist on the known topology. So we're gonna now take these DFAs that are in the operator specified policy and take the topology that the network administrator knows without knowledge of which links might be up or down at any given time, because that's a dynamic property. This is just the design topology. We now wanna combine those together and figure out exactly how the probe should be propagated and when we need more than one probe. Okay. So this is probably the most technical part of the talk, so I apologize if this is a, is a, little, bit, a little bit more detailed. So what we're gonna do now by joining these DFAs with the topology is we're gonna generate a product graph where every node in that graph is gonna include the ID of the node itself, the physical node in the topology, as well as the state in the DFA, in this case in each of the two DFAs. And an edge in the product graph is gonna be a movement in the physical graph as well as a tra whatever transitions would take place in those two DFAs. So that all completely in a global way represent everything that can happen when a probe propagates from one node to the other. Okay? And that's gonna determine exactly how we tag and, and duplicate the probes. So just to take this example here on the left, we've got the topology and the two DFAs. And as we generate the product graph, we'll start at the destination. Again, this is all taking place in the compiler running above the network at compile time. We're starting at node D. We're in state one in both of the DFAs because we are starting at the destination and we can move forward one step in each of the two DFAs. And when D propagates a probe to C and to D, when it propagates to C, the first red DFA will now be in a permanent failure state, will never satisfy DFA one. And so we can have, that's represented by the red dash in that, in that branch. And it will continue to be in state one in the second DFA. And the, and the, when it propagates a probe to B, B will move forward in the first DFA and, stay at, and, and also move forward in the, in the second DFA. And that's represented by the B22 and the fact that this is an accepting state. So this path can actually be used. And we continue along in this vein, as mimicking what the propagation of probes would be. Again, so far without regard to the actual metrics on the paths, this is just capturing the rankings of the paths and how they might be inconsistent with one another. Notice now, I had a four node topology and I ended up with a six node product graph. And that can happen here because nodes can have inconsistent rankings. And so what you can see here is node B appears twice and node A appears twice. And this reflects the fact that they might pick different paths and need to propagate different paths to others based on that. And that's gonna dictate the cases where we now have to send extra information in the protocol. But notice this didn't double. We didn't go from four nodes to eight nodes. So we've figured out places where we can afford to skimp on propagating additional information in the protocol. Okay. So by combining the topology and the DFAs into this product graph, now we know all the information we need to figure out at compile time what each switch needs in terms of what state it needs to keep about the paths and how it should propagate those paths to others, to forward packets correctly and to propagate probes correctly. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So in the end then, node B in this graph would end up having a table with two different paths. And it needs those two different paths because the way it wants to forward packets is different than the way node A wants to forward packets, similar to the example I had a few slides ago. So in this particular case, B's best path to the destination goes through C. Because in this case, particularly now I have metrics on the links, it can actually see that the path it has through C has a 20% utilization because both the BC and CD links 
are 20% are or lower. But A, on the other hand, would actually prefer its other path that goes through, through D directly. And this information computed at compile time combined with the information in the metrics populates this table. And now, at runtime, A and B are both equipped to make decisions. B will forward any packets it originates based on the second entry. And any packets B receives from A will be tagged appropriately so that, A, that B knows which of these two entries to use and will propagate the packets on the, on the first path. So going on to a little bit more detail about some of the other challenges, we can easily get forwarding loops. And this, this arises because unlike the Hula and Conga work, which worked in a purely shortest path setting in a symmetric data center topology, now we're supporting arbitrary graphs. And we're allowing non-shortest paths to be used because they might actually be the ones that have the best performance. And distance vector routing is notorious for having all sorts of challenges with count to infinity problems and so on. So we have to grapple with these here. Uh, fortunately, we can borrow ideas from existing work. It's a long study problem, so we don't have to do anything particularly clever uh, here. But just to, just to refresh you on how this works, you imagine a graph like this one, where again, the, the weights are the utilizations of the links, and everyone's trying to minimize the maximum utilized path. You would end up, let's say, with D sending probes to A and S, and A propagating uh, probes to B and S. And this would be the set of paths you would end up with. A is forwarding to D, S is forwarding through A, and B is forwarding through S. But imagine B has not yet finished propagating information to A about the path that it's using. It's possible that while A is waiting to hear from B about B's path, A's own path becomes worse. In this case, let's say the link between A and D goes from 10% utilized to 50% utilized. So A now thinks this path is not very good. Moments later, it may receive, a, oops, sorry. Something went wrong there. Uh, moments later, it may receive the probe from B. It may learn that B has a great path that goes with, with much less utilization. Unbeknownst to A, A is actually on that path, and that path has a loop. A will pick it because it looks better than the 50% utilized path, and we'll end up with a permanent forwarding loop. Okay, this is a kind of classic problem with distance vector routing, that information that arrives late about an old path will compete with fresh information about a path that just got worse, and you'll end up with a permanent loop. So a solution that's, that's commonly used here uh, is, to, is to, adopted by other protocols like Babel and, uh, and uh, DSDV can solve this problem. But if, before getting into that, I mean, a natural question you might have is why not just use path vector routing? Right? BGP and other protocols like it will in include the identity of all the hops in the path uh, to be able to do loop detection directly. And we could do that, uh, but it has much larger overhead on the packets because now you have to have a list of all of the nodes in the path, and each node has to process that list to see if its own identifier is already in the path. And second, it's also hard to do that directly in the data plane. That's much more complicated processing than we think we can do in these programmable switches. So instead, we adopt a solution that's used in some other distance vector protocols used in wireless mesh networks, which is essentially to put version numbers on probes. So instead of sending a probe once and then only sending a new probe when the metrics change, we'll send probes periodically with version numbers. And that will allow a, host, a node that's receiving a probe to know if it reflects an old version of the path or a new one. And by favoring the new probes over the old probes, we'll flush out this stale information in the example we had here. So in particular, when A receives a probe from D saying, oh gosh, now this path is 50% utilized, that will be, a, a, say, a version I plus one probe from D. But an earlier probe sent by D, from D that will eventually reach A, maybe late, will be tagged with an earlier version number reflecting the old path. And A will be in the position to know that even though the older path looks better, it shouldn't be considered because it's no longer, it's no longer fresh. And so A will continue forwarding uh, directly to D based on the new probe, and it will discard the old probe. Okay, this is not a new idea. It's used in a number of distance vector protocols, and we adopt it here uh, to be able to, to avoid loops. Right. But unfortunately, we're not done yet because we're not, we're not running a conventional distance vector protocol. We're doing a number of things that these earlier protocols didn't do. And in particular, one of the things we're doing is what's called flowlet switching. So we're, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we're grouping packets together into, into flowlets. If the packets from the same uh, download are close together in time, like say less than a handful of seconds apart, we would actually group them together. And our intent is we'll make one forwarding decision for the first packet in the flowlet, and all the others will follow the same next hop, even if another path now looks better. Now, why are we doing that? Well, that for two reasons. By grouping these packets together, we'll make sure that they, if they go with the same next hops all through their journey through the network, they'll arrive at the receiver in order rather than be delivered out of order. And that's good because some higher level protocols like TCP don't like packets being delivered out of order. 
makes performance worse. But also by grouping packets into flowlets and making the same decision for all the packets in the same flowlet, we're also making the forwarding more stable. We're helping avoid some of the oscillations that load sensitive protocols are subject to. So for both reasons, we'd like to be able to pin a group of related packets in a short period of time to the same forwarding decision. And this breaks the loop detection mechanism I just described a moment ago. Because now, because flowlet switching is not policy aware. And so in fact, what can end up happening is different switches in the network at different times can have, uh, can have their flowlet entries expire and lead, and lead to forwarding loops. So conventional way you would implement flowlet switching, again, not a new idea, is you might have an ID for the flowlet, like the five tuple of the flow. You might have the next stop that's been picked for the first, first such packet of this flowlet and a timestamp. So that when a packet arrives, you would look at the entry and say, oh, a small amount of time has elapsed since the last packet of my flowlet, so I should use this existing next top. Or when you arrive, you either don't see an entry, or you see one that was quite stale from a long time period ago, and you're allowed to freshly pick the current best path. Okay, schemes like Conga and Hula use this basic idea. Okay, but then, again, as I mentioned, this won't work very well. And I'll just show you a simple example why this won't work in our context, even though it works in the context of Conga and Hula. So imagine you've got this policy, again, highly contrived, where you want to use either the upper path, S-C-E-F-D, or the lower path, S-A-E-B-D, but never some other combination. In other words, you don't want packets to start on the top and switch to the bottom, or start on the bottom and switch to the top. But that could actually happen if we just blindly use this loop detection mechanism I described earlier, along with flowlet switching. Let's give a simple example. Let's suppose we're happily using path one. It's got the best uh, utilization. Flowlets have been established, and so we're happily forwarding packets that are on flowlets that have already been pinned to use this path. Now the upper path becomes better. Unfortunately, the timing of the expiration of the flowlets is different on different switches. And so we might be in a situation where a packet arrives at S and a new flowlet starts, but that packet still belongs to an old flowlet in some of the other downstream nodes. That could happen if there were differences in queuing delay, for example, of the previous packets that were delivered over the lower path. So the packets might arrive at E, and E might still see this packet as belonging to a flowlet that is pinned to go to the bottom path. And so again, we're stuck. We might be in a situation where we take the path A, C, E, B, D, and this packet is not only taking a less preferred path, but in this case, it's actually taking one that's disallowed by the policy. So it's not only that we're doing a transiently poor job in respecting path utilization as a metric, we're actually violating potentially the security policy or some other uh, constraints. So this is a severe, uh, severe problem for the protocol. So these decentralized decisions are problematic, right? Because we might end up making, making a policy violating decision based on it. So the solution here is not particularly complicated. The basic idea, I hinted at it a moment ago, is, is that flowlet switching isn't policy aware, but it needs to be. So the main thing we're going to do now is define flowlets based not only on the identifier of the flowlet, but also on the version of the policy uh, that's being used. In particular, we'll keep track of the tag that was used in the match to make the decision at, at node S. This is a form of a consistent update, if people are familiar with consistent updates. We're essentially letting the packet as it arrives get tagged with the version of the policy that determined how this packet was forwarded. And so the flowlet definition at E would now view this new packet as not actually belonging to the old flowlet because it has a different policy tag on it. And it would be obliged to start a new flowlet for this packet and the others that follow, forcing it to take the upper path. So finally, just to give you a sense of, of how this all comes together, the Contra prototype is, a, is about 7,500 lines of F-sharp code that implements all the kind of mechanisms I mentioned and expresses them in P4 code that gets sent out to each of the underlying switches. And then, th then those switches will now run at runtime, the dynamic protocol that's been specified. So we've, we have that written in, in F-sharp. It generates P4 code that runs on the uh, software behavioral model uh, for P4. And then we did experiments both in Mininet and, and also in, there's a simulator called NS3 where you can write P4 programs and actually run them directly inside a simulator. And we've also run these on software switches running directly on physical computers uh, in Cloud Lab. And so essentially what we wanted to do was study a bunch of different topologies to understand how well the protocol performs compared to other schemes in data center networks, which, they, which the earlier schemes were designed to run on, and for us are just one of many cases we can handle, we want to study the metrics that those earlier papers studied, which is to optimize for, let's say, the completion time of the flows in the network. And to compare to conventional schemes like equal cost multipath, which is uh, not load aware, 
uh, Hula, which is sort of the, the original inspiration for this work, but is narrower in the set of topologies it can run on and set of metrics it can use. And Spain, which is a, a simple scheme for doing uh, load, uh, load sensitive, spl doing splitting over multiple potentially non shortest paths in the network. So we'll use Hula to study how we do in data center networks in Spain, which runs on arbitrary topologies to compare uh, for, for networks that don't, uh, are not data center. And I'll just show you a couple of quick results that give you a, a hint of how this looks. So if we start with a, a fat tree topology commonly used in data centers, and we're trying to pick among the shortest path, the one that has the least utilization, the most available capacity, this is exactly the setting Hula and Congo were designed for. So as you might expect, we would perform no better than Hula. We could potentially for, perform a little bit worse because, because we're handling arbitrary topologies. We have a little bit of extra information that gets sent in probes and a little bit of extra information that gets tagged on the packets to be able to handle scenarios that Hula doesn't have to deal with. So um, this, on the, on the y-axis here is the flow completion time, so lower values are better. The x-axis is network load, so as load goes up, all of these schemes have worse flow completion times. Equal cost multipath is not load aware, so it starts to fall over much earlier. Under lower network load, we find some paths congested, causing flows to have bad completion times. Hula and Contra perform almost identically. As you might expect, Hula is just slightly better. It's not visible in the graph, just because it's slightly smaller overhead. But the additional mechanisms that we have in the protocol don't, uh, don't cost much, and so it's almost indistinguishable. But if we run on arbitrary topologies, uh, again, we'll see uh, shortest path, purely shortest path routing, not based on load, not do particularly well. Spain, the scheme we're comparing against, does better, but we actually do even better because we're able to search more effectively and dynamically for the least loaded paths in the network uh, and, and direct traffic to them, whereas Spain is not able uh, to make those dynamic decisions. So these give us a sense that we do pretty well in, in handling load sensitive routing. And under the covers, it also means that we're not having very, very bad oscillation. Sure, paths are changing and the protocol is sometimes making one path less attractive and having to switch to a more attractive one. But those phenomena are not happening at a level that compromises performance in a significant way. And then looking a little further under the hood, I'll just kind of be brief here in the interest of having more discussion, that we see very, very few transient loops. Loops can happen briefly in our, in our protocol, but they, they get squelched pretty quickly. And in, in these experiments, a very, very tiny fraction of the packets got stuck in loops. And I should stress, even when loops happen in our protocol because of the way we tag the packets, those packets in loops don't violate the higher level policies. If there's some disallowed path, a path with rank infinity, even a packet in a loop will not take that path. So we don't have to worry that we're violating the constraints on routing. We're just taking slightly suboptimal paths uh, for this small fraction of the packets. And, and similarly, when we look at the degree of load imbalance between the paths, this is sort of an indication of how well we're doing at balancing load. We see much less imbalance in, than we would see uh, in other schemes like equal cost multipath. These are at least somewhat of a hint that the protocol dynamics are, are, are pretty good. So finally, just to conclude, performance-aware distance vector routing gives network administrators a way to have much more flexible policies. Doing it with a high-level language allows them to get away from the gory details of programming these next-generation programmable switch architectures. And, and yet, our compiler can take advantage of these new switches by automatically synthesizing the P4 code that will run in them. We have good performance that scales to large network topologies, and in particular, more importantly, arbitrary topologies. And it can perform competitively to solutions that are tailored to a particular set of metrics and a particular graph, like, like Hula and Contra that run just in data center networks. So, so far, we've been running our experiments on software switches, uh, like the P4 behavioral model uh, in NS3 and in Cloud Lab. And one of the next things we'd like to do is to take the extra step of going to some of the uh, hardware uh, implementations of P4, which have some additional constraints to make sure we can run our, our protocols on, on real uh, underlying switches. And in particular, also, I, I mentioned earlier, when policies are not isotonic, uh, we, we do a sort of analysis and decomposition of them. But there are cases where our decomposition fails, where a policy is, is complicated to implement efficiently uh, without propagating a large number of probes. And what we, we'd like to go back and actually see what we can do to at least approximate good implementations of those more sophisticated policies. Here we can implement some, but not all of them. Right, I'll be happy to stop here so we have time for discussion. So, Jen will now take questions from the tables. Okay, this was easy. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> What's up? Clearly, I've seen it. I have a question. So, this has just been bugging me for a long time. It won't be sort of low balance. 
is this sort of microscale load balancing a real problem? In the sense that I sort of think of the world in two ways. Like either like the network is pretty stable, the traffic is pretty stable, you don't need a complex distributed algorithm, traffic engineering will now work pretty fine. Right. On the other hand, you have extreme microscale problems where you really cannot react and there's not actionable, right? My best chance is to let the flow die. Yeah. So what regimes is this actually useful? Yeah, Do I need this complexity? I'm not even sure this might pose any class a real problem section. Yeah, it's a great question. I think the, in the context of the data center, it seems to be worthwhile because you can end up with quite bursty traffic on a small time scale. And also there's an attempt in those networks to run the networks at extremely high levels of utilization in order to amortize the cost of the infrastructure. So I think in data center settings, that's where it's perhaps most important. In wide area settings, particularly ISP backlands, they tend to run them a bit underutilized in order to be you know, prepared for traffic they do not appreciate is going to come. They don't know in advance the traffic quite as well. And also, the time scale of those networks, if they're, let's say, nationwide, is a bit larger, in which case the ability to react in you know, the sort of data plane time scale is maybe a little bit less important. So well, I think. Even for the data plane time scale, right, I can think of like two scenarios. Either it's a short lived burst that I cannot really do anything, mm -hmm. or it's slightly long lived, in which case I can probably detect who's the heavy meter and do something specialized for those people. Right. So in either case, I have a, seems like a seemingly simpler solution to this problem. Yeah. On a complex distributed protocol, so I guess I'm not sure, quite sure. Or yeah, no, what, a, where, what time scale is this the right answer? For? Yeah, I, mean, I think what data kind of center, is the right answer. It's for? a completely fair question. I think data center time scales for sure. I think it does make sense because of the, and it's not just about the time scale, it's also about the, the utilization people want to run the networks at. That the ability to adapt more quickly is worthwhile in those settings. So I think it relates a bit to the propagation delay of the network because that determines the time scale of the control loop. And in which case, if you're in a wide area setting, it's a little less important because inherently, whether you do it in the data plane or not, the time scale has up, gone up a notch. And, and it also depends on how close to the bleeding edge of utilization you actually want to run your network, which, and, and, and also how shallow your buffers are. Mm -hmm. right? In the context of a data center, they tend to have small time scale, shallow buffers, bursty workloads, running at the bleeding edge of utilization. So that's the setting where it seems to make the most sense. Even in the wide area, I would argue one advantage of doing it in the data plane, it's not, I'm not convinced it's strictly necessary mm -hmm. for the reasons you mentioned, is it's nice not to have something outside of the network that's an additional point of dependency. And also even running in software on the nodes on the switch, there's always a risk that other things are also running in that software. So having something that's decomposed so it runs entirely in one layer without having side effects, if you will, from processing load and other things that might be going on in software is appealing. And also the fact that if it's running in P4, if we have good verification techniques for knowing that programs are correct, there's a hope that we can actually understand that code. Whereas if we try to implement it in arbitrary software that runs, let's say, in the, uh, in the software control plane, maybe a little bit more challenging to know that the protocol is actually correct. That's sort of a more informal argument. I wouldn't say that's, you know, that's not a time scale question. That's just more, hey, we can implement this entirely in one layer and not have interaction effects with other layers. So there's some nice robustness benefits that could come from that. But that doesn't directly respond to your time scale question. Yeah. Uh, just to follow up on that question. So you said that this word makes a lot more sense in data center context, right? But then I would argue that the assumptions that you are making are a bit too strong for data center context. For example, the topology, right? You're assuming any arbitrary topology. In data center, you generally have structured topologies. And I think that you showed a result that you have some extra overheads if you assume arbitrary topologies, right? So if really it's focused towards data center, then why can't we just use Conga and other things that are really Yeah, that's fair. To be clear, I wasn't suggesting it's only use one data center. I said I think the, the assumptions are more fitting to that. I would say two things there. I think one is people have looked at non-regular topologies for data centers like Jellyfish, for, for example, in UAGC. And so if you, and also even in a regular topology, non-shortest paths could be used and be useful in some settings, particularly under failures. And those tend not to be usable at all in the, in the content. So I think even in a data center setting, if you had different topologies or were more willing to use non-shortest paths, then there'd still be a place for these extra mechanisms to allow those paths to get used. And I think there's also things in between. I mean, if I, when I mentioned wide area, one is like, a, let's say, a transit backbone, and the second would be like a private backbone that like the cloud providers have. And there, too, they want to run those at the bleeding edge of utilization. So some of the assumptions about utilization become true there. Wide area users are also starting to get interested in these cheaper commodity shallow buffer switches where, again, if they want to run at high utilization with cheap switches, they may start to care a bit more. So it's a little bit of a, it's a little circular because it depends a little on how, how loaded the network's going to be and what kind of switches you need and whether the wide area uh, would make good use of this or not. Great question. Yeah. We had a question about how routing around link failures works. 
Yeah, yeah. So basically what happens if a, if a link fails, uh, the, the simplest case is the next probe would actually not arrive over that path and that would cause you to choose other paths. More generally, you could imagine, I suppose, other mechanisms, but that's what we're using right now is the probes are, are doing value detection. Yeah? Um, so we were wondering what the uh, nature of the state required in the switches uh, in order to implement this and right. how much state, what, is it, what does it look like? Right, so let's suppose you have no, no constraints, you're just using a single metric, everything's right. isotone. And then for every destination, every switch would have a single best next time. Single best. All right, and that would be learned by then. Because the probes are being sent periodically, right. you wouldn't have to keep the alternate paths because you would relearn them as they become relevant. And, you would, and that would be the path that you use and the, and the probe you send those to. But only one. Right, only one. Or switch. Right. Now, if you have non-isotone policies, like the ABD example I had earlier in the talk, in that case, node B was keeping a table with two entries to the same destination, one reflecting the path it prefers, and the other preferring the best path by the other metric, if you will, that A is going to use, in which case we're keeping two. So with isotone policies, it's one per destination per node. And then it could, if there's two metrics and the policy can be decomposed into two isotone policies, it's at most two. And it depends on the product graph. Basically, the number of nodes that represent the same physical node in the product graph determine the size of that node's table. So in that example I had, two of the nodes had two, and the others had one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one question we had was whether the policy language was high level enough. Uh, does an average network administrator or operator actually know how to um, articulate all the constraints and metrics that they would need? Yeah, that's a great question. I could imagine going higher level than that and actually synthesizing even that higher level language. It's not unlike, I mean, if you look at BGP configurations, doing regular expressions on paths is, is a common mechanism in BGP configuration also. So it sort of mimics a bit what goes on in BGP configuration. Now, one could argue BGP configuration is not exactly the gold standard for, for being able to configure a network well. So I don't think it's, I think the, the kinds of things that are in the language are not unfamiliar. But might it make more sense to have some sort of network-wide, uh, truly network-wide objective that gets synthesized even into this intermediate language? I think that, that's, that's a completely fair question. Yeah. And that could, make, that could indeed make sense. For example, let's suppose the link CD is untrusted. And the reason all these regular expressions exist is because of that. It might be nice to have some way to just say that CD is untrusted, avoid it if you can. Right. And that, that would be a little higher level than what we have now because right now we'd be specifying that you know, in this lower level if then else kind of. Okay, one last question. Yeah. Are there policies that don't compile? Yes. Yeah, our table spent a while on this question. So, what, so one example of this is uh, widest, shortest path. Sorry, shortest, widest path. So I want to pick the shortest among the least utilized paths. So I've got a path that's very lightly utilized. I'm happy with it. I propagate it upstream, and that next link is super congested. And I would have really wished I had remembered the second widest path because somebody else might have wanted it. And the third widest path because you don't, you don't know exactly how long the path, like if the widest path is really long, I would have rather have remembered some of the shorter ones that were just a little less wide because they'll have been preferred later. And so that one is one that we can't compile. It's not that it can't be implemented, but it requires, in the worst case, a very large number of paths to be learned. And so we throw up our hands and say, we can't decompose that into a small number of ISOs and policies. And, and so the compiler would just tell the network operator to back. So, so is it like it's theoretically possible? To it compile, is theoretically but it's possible. Just something that you say this is too complicated of a policy. Exactly. We're not gonna. Our current algorithm takes all the metrics that appear in policies and propagates a probe for the best path according to each of those metrics. And the policy I just mentioned can't be implemented in that, in that structure, and so we choose the program. Cool. All right, let's make it.